because they had a really a nasty situation. They sent me a form to fill out before they made the decision. They want to know what colleges my parents had graduated from. And, you know, I don't think my father went to elementary school. Too. Yeah, and years ago, a lot of places had strange questions, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, they were looking for people that had money to Perhaps. endow chairs and things. Perhaps. What was, Illinois, what was the campus on Illinois like? Oh, that was very nice. Uh -huh. Now, is that where you met? Did you meet your? Were you married at that I time? I met my wife there. Okay. And then, after the second or third year, in the third year, we got married and lived on campus housing. Was she also a student? She had been a student, okay. but she stopped working. Stopped being a student when we graduated. Okay. Well, when we got married, I should say. Okay. Then what came next? After that, tell us about. Then did I, you? You didn't serve in the military. Did you have to serve in the military? No, okay. I was on the borderline. Okay. And I. There was a Korean War, and I got a, a deferment. There was some kind of a public examination that you had to take, and depending on your score, you were exempt or not exempt. Mm -hmm. And then but actually, where I came from, so very few of the people went to college that I once got a letter from my draft board saying, you know, please apply for deferment, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what was the career path before you came to Purdue? You came to Purdue in, what, 58, didn't you? Yeah. yeah. And then for my graduate from Illinois, I went to Stanford for three years as an instructor. And then I came to Purdue in 1958. Okay. How did how did you hear about the position at Purdue? Were they recruiting? Or? Some guy from the physics department traveled out there to recruit me. So. What was the campus like when you came? The, 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 the school, and you came to the physics department, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, it was uh, not as well, not as big as it is now, but not as many students, no. probably. No, we for two years we rented a university house across from the union where there's a union garage now. Oh, there were houses there. There was two houses, and another guy in physics, Frank Leffler, rented the neighboring one that I rented. Mm, good. It was close to campus. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And was right next door there was a, a Baptist Student Association or something. And our kids, I remember, used to look out the window watching them as they were conducting their <laughs> services and stuff. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, tell us a little bit about when, when you first came, about your teaching and your research and how you got acclimated to Purdue yeah. and the department. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, well, I don't know. I taught. I taught uh, mostly graduate courses, because that's the guy who recruited me, wanted to have a modern slant on the subject electrodynamics. So I was a, kind of obliged to teach that, and I taught another course too, in you know, the graduate level course. Okay, were you involved in some, what was your research, were you involved the in research, that? Research, yeah. Okay. And at the time there were, high, high mesons had been discovered, and we were trying to understand what they were all about. Okay, okay. Um, let's <coughs> see. Then, um, were you on any. Uh, the promotion and tenure process was a lot different than I imagine. No, no, no. no it was the same as it is pretty much now? Yeah, it was. Okay. A, the uh, primary committee met. Okay. No, I don't remember. The primary committee didn't meet. The department had to make a decision, if I remember correctly, who should be promoted. I mean, he took advice from sure. the senior staff. And then you would call in the full professor one at a time and get their opinions on it. Mm -hmm. But that was changed. Yes. And so the, now the system, the primary committee was all fools, not like today with associates mixed in. And uh, then it went to the area committee and then to the university committee. University committee. Yeah. Right, yeah. So when you, Hubdi was the president when you came. Yes. Right. Who was the head of the, of the department at that time? Well, that's another interesting story. There was a the guy like Horowitz, you may have heard of him. He oh, was the yes. one who created Purdue University as a physics researcher. Really put it on the map, right? Right. He had come in 1929 or so. And uh, when I came here for a job interview, he interviewed me. You know, and that was the reason he was, was he the head of the department yeah, at yeah. the time? Okay. He had been head of the department since 1930, give or take a year. And, you know, and he had fights with the dean, so 
all decisions you need to be made by the demon who wrote that up. You know, it was a real, but he was a tyrant too. Everybody worked there from you know, sun up uh, <laughs> to midnight. And uh, what did I want to say about that? The department heads you were, you were saying. Yeah, yeah, was, was this guy. Well, he died while I was, between the time when I was interviewing off of the job until I came, he died. He had a big heart attack. So, uh, you know, he was Viennese and his wife used to make a lot of good pastries. And once a month, he had the whole department come in and enjoy his wife's pastries. So, anyway, he died until I got here. When I got here, Hubert James was head. And uh, he, was, he was a good head, too. Mm -hmm. Did he stay for a while? Yeah, he okay. was head. I don't know. And then a fellow named Dick King became head. Okay. When he died of a open, it was one of the first open heart surgeries, and he didn't come out of it alive. And then there was a sequence of, I don't remember. Oh. Uh, one of the names that I did have was Tendum. He was an associate head for Adam a long time. Tendum, yeah. Yeah, and he he's was. since passed away, though, hasn't he? Yeah, recently. Not too About long. six months ago. Right, so. yeah, okay. Uh, one of the other appointments that you got was the uh, assistant dean in the grad school. Tell us a little bit about that, how that well, came about. Uh, Fred Andrew was the dean. Right, I had a note on that. Yeah, and he was, and he always had uh, assistant deans that took, that had the responsibility to approve all acceptances of graduate students and a whole bunch of things like that. It was mostly rubber stamp, but I think you had to use some discretion. And so there was one in physical sciences, that's probably one in humanities and one engineering, I don't, I don't remember. But there we were in an office, a bunch of tables, and the secretaries would get all the papers and put it in our inbox. And Stanford. Where were you located at that time? Where was the grad school? In the grad house. Oh, is it where it is now? That building had been built in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, that, this was around 1972, I, according to that, yeah. Give or take. Sure, okay. And the normal uh, term was about uh, three years, but somehow I wound up doing it for five years. I don't remember what the deal was. I wanted to keep you on for a while. <laughs> yeah. No, Fred Andrews, we used to go every Friday, all the assistant deans and Fred Andrews and associate deans would go to Mars Bryant's for lunch. It was really, it was really good. I'd stay on, too, if I could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that then, we, well, we got, we got $600 supplement salary-wise and uh, to pay for that stuff as well. Sure. And, uh, he was, you know, and he would give us really low down on um, what was going on behind the administrative seal. Give you the, the low down. <laughs> oh, he was, uh, was really pleasant. Yeah, I've heard that he was. Uh, uh, yeah. um, the United, you were the resident, well, United Fund, you and Dr. Trackman were co-heads for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. It was called the United, now United Fund, but now it's the United Way at that mm -hmm. time. Now the... Um, the resident director for the student year abroad. Let's talk a little about that because you were the first in the history of the program for a faculty member from the School of Science. Yeah, I'm probably the only one. Oh, so tell us a little about that. This is the, for the researchers. This is the early years of study abroad. Yeah, well, the thing is, both my wife and I were born in Germany. Well, she left it at the age of six. I left at the age of eight. But it was enough that uh, I could communicate in German. You know, I had a brush up and so on. Like I used to get German newspapers and read them. Just to, and so I think that's what sold the university on our going there. It was kind of an embarrassment. I remember when I got there, the guy before me from IU, he didn't know German. So it was not possible for him to be accepted in among the faculty in, so, in the social life. You know, that we could go and be invited to dinner, we were invited to many dinners by faculty, and uh, we could communicate in German. Otherwise, you know, even though some, a lot of the people spoke English, it was kind of awkward right. that uh, when you're in Germany, to speak English when some people 
It was a, there were three universities that were involved in this program, were there not? It wasn't Wisconsin and IU and Purdue in this group? IU, Purdue, and I there was one woman, I don't know, she came from some small oh, liberal okay. arts college. Right. The but the re did, what was the resident, what were your duties, what was the responsibilities there? Oh, it was, uh, it was a full-time job. You know, we had an office and we had 24 Yeah, you were stationed students. in Germany then? In Germany, in Hamburg. Okay. okay. And, uh, we had to sign up the students to take courses in Germany. From Purdue? From Purdue. They were they we got credit and we had to make a decision to what the equivalent Purdue to give credits was. I thought it was a big responsibility. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's what about housing? Did, did they provide housing for you and your, was your wife and family no, going well, with you? You know, just my wife. My oh. family was still away in college okay. at the time. And, uh, See, what did they, it, it was a housing, it was subsidized housing. We got a, a beautiful large apartment in a university building that was, you know, we used that to entertain not only faculty but also all the students would come in. Like I remember at the time, the dollar was way down relative to the mark, so the students weren't getting proteins. And you have to understand this, in Germany, no student goes hungry we can go into something called the Mensa. That's like a, a, a place where students eat. Like a co-op or something like yeah. that. Uh -huh. And you could always get noodles with some sauce for free. That's, they call that custom sauce. That there's no charge for it. So the students had something to eat. And they didn't that was eat. nutritious. I don't know it was nutritious. Well, got some it was Like spaghetti. Yeah, sure, I understand. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so, you know, the students could live, well, anyway, my wife had an aunt in Hamburg, and she, and she had a, a lady friend who was uh, in the restaurant business, so we were able to get sausages at very, very reduced rates. And, you know, my wife would buy them, and the students would come mm -hmm. and, you know, line up these enormous sausages, and there was a meter stick. You know, it was five marks for <laughs> so many centimeters of stuff. You know, oh, great. That's nice. You know, so they, they felt they were getting their money's worth. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah. yeah. Did, what kind of entertaining did you do? Just for the students or was there... We to entertain the students. The students would come over. And sure. It was a big enough place that we didn't want. And, uh, and the people would invite us to dinner and we went in. And say for Thanksgiving, we ran a big fest. Uh, we had in this building we were in there were other apartments, not as we had the biggest but uh, they would have they made three turkeys on three different ovens on different floors and they invited we were right near the American at the embassy but the consular office and so the girls some of the girls were friends with the marine guards so they invited the marines <laughs> over you know, and then somebody Great. gave us money sure. to buy this, so you know, it was, it was a really nice, nice occasion. It was very yeah. nice. Right. Yeah. Did the students live in the same building with you? No, the oh. students were distributed over all kinds of dormitories. On the, uh, the campus of the school? On the campus or some off campus. Oh, okay. And the idea was to put them in a situation where they have to speak German, so they couldn't mix with each other. I mean, they could, I had a, an apartment kind of for the students that uh, they would come and it was kind of their hangout. Um, did did uh, the courses must have been different? They they were special courses, but they were only taught in German. Is that what you're? No, these were normal university courses. Okay. And but the instruction was language yeah. was that German? It was German. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, okay. they went in with regular German students. Okay. That was the idea. Well, they first they came and they had a couple of months. It was called Deutsches Fremdsprache. That means German is a foreign language. Okay. And they were really uh, grilled in that. And then they had to go, so sink or swim. Right. Although I must say, the German system isn't as demanding as the American system. Okay. I'll keep so, that in mind. Hmm? I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, <laughs> what, were you, how long were you over there for a year? Okay. Did you do? What, were you able to do some traveling? What about on vacations and things? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah we would travel all over. Uh, well, mostly we socialized with Joe's aunt, and 
let's see, what did we do? We took a trip to Israel over Christmas, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And we went traveling to visit you know, the place where Joe was born. And, and right. And we met this family. It was a curious thing. This woman had a, a daughter studying at IU, studying Spanish of all things. And so she wanted to get in touch with her for some reason, I forget what, that something had come up about a, a dorm room or something, and, she, and the daughter was traveling in Mexico. So they were stymied. They didn't speak any English. And so she, the woman called me up and asked if I could, you know, somehow help them to get a hold of their daughter, because they had no way of reaching her, or get a hold of the people in charge of the accommodation. I did that. Well, you know, it was just a small matter for me. Right. This is before cell phones. <laughs> before cell phones. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, and you know, and then the next day when I came to home, there was an enormous uh, bunch of flowers there, oh, nice. sitting right here. So naturally, I had to call up the lady Fanker and so sure. on, and we became friends with them. But the like, yeah, they gave us three hundred marks. That was. That oh, was like a lot of money in those days sure. for the turkeys. That's what most went for the turkeys. That's very nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You really enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. and they were best friends now. We're going, they were going to go to uh, Europe on a cruise this summer. And one of the places was going to stop a week to stay with them. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the woman is, has gone blind since then. So. It'll be nice. To, yeah, she'll so appreciate that. Yeah, but that's something we're that looking forward to. Sure. You know, I would think so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> now, let's move on to Secretary of the Faculty, how that came about. Who was your predecessor? Uh, Nelson Parkhurst. Okay. Now, that, but he was in admissions, okay? A registrar. He was a registrar. So right. He was a registrar, and he did this on the side. Okay. He had a special secretary for uh, handling University Senate business. Well, how, how did how did you get the position? Then tell the research a little bit about it. What, what well, transpired? Uh, t I, my I surmised this, the following is what happened: that the secretary, I was secretary of the School of Science Council. I used to write the minutes on the house of the dean, and when he became provost and they needed somebody to replace Parkhurst, in this, he called me. I think when we were in Germany at the time. Called me and said if I would do that for a year. Oh, sure. And, uh, you know, and I stayed there for 20 some years. <laughs> for the researchers, tell them what the secretary of the faculty so what what that position entailed. <clears throat> oh, it's a, Did you go to the, you went, you went to the minutes, or you went to the meetings? Yeah, it okay. involved many things. Okay. And the job was expanded, gradually expanded while I was there. Yeah, you know, talk a little bit about that. Okay. Yeah. It used to be you just had to, uh, well, you had certain responsibilities for keeping track of the uh, committees. Uh, you know, that the committees have new people coming in all the time and have to arrange it to have a, a meeting of the chair and so on. And there was another guy who used to do the, who used to do the committees. And... Uh, he got very ill. He got diabetes and I lose, lost a foot. So, so I started to do that too. And, uh, and then by statute, or by statute in the university sense, uh, people came and uh, uh, there are certain committees, like there's a committee that interacts with all the regional campuses. And I, I was chair the secretary of that committee. So In uh, addition to being secretary of the faculty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I don't, but don't only, I arranged it so that it only met once a year and nobody was really that anxious to meet more than once. It was just a way to communicate and get to see people so you could call them if the need comes up and so on. Okay. I did that and uh, we used to write letters to for deceased faculty when there was a what about the uh, memorial resolutions? Yeah, you, yeah. Oh, you would see I that those were taken care of? Yeah, yeah. They would all come to me, and I would publish them in the minutes. I'd also send a co several copies of them to the next of kin. Okay. Usually, yeah. Right. 
Yeah. I don't know if they do that today. We've done it, and I know you get. I remember when I've done a couple. We got some guidance on how long it should be, and you know whatever on that. Wouldn't some guy send me a check for five hundred dollars? Not to me, to the university. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. The, I, 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 I've heard similar stories that the, the family members. Sometimes they were unaware that this was being done, and then all of a sudden it would arrive at the home, and they were really mm-hmm. pleased. Oh yeah, yeah. It's very nice. Oh, yeah. A little bit like taps, what they do now for the students. You know? Okay. They have that TAPS program, you know, for the one the students that have died over the last six months. They have it at the, near the bell tower, and uh, the student dean of students runs that. And it's, it's very mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, know, yeah. They walk over from uh, Elliot to where it is. That mm-hmm. right. Um, you know, that was really that was a I think that was it was a halftime job, but I only only got it for one one day a week. But you had a secretary to, to help take care of that. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. That would type up the uh, th- would type up the minutes. Yeah. Now, once the minutes were typed, then when, what, who looked at the draft before they were surfacing? Me. Okay. I was the only one, and then would go to the Senate, and so everybody had a chance to look at it and make corrections. And there were very rarely were there corrections. All right. Number one, sort of. Then you served under several presidents because, well, Hub, when you, when you first, was it, what, Hanson? Was that the first one when you? I okay. served under Hanson. Okay, as a secretary. As secretary. Then Dr. Baring. Then Hicks. Oh, John Hicks, right. Revere, then Deering, and okay. then Yishke. Right, yeah. How did the Documents and Records Committee come about? For research, this was a committee that... Well, it was a stuff. trick of uh, Parker set it up. Oh, it was already in existence when you... Yeah, 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 no, because he, he was a big pusher of the academic procedure manual. You know, there's a business manual we're going to have, and so on, but he didn't want to have any administration in charge of it. So that's why I set up that committee. The committee is the one that's really responsible. The faculty committee, that's, I agree with that completely. All right, yeah, that was a good committee, though. Yeah. You, know, you, did yeah. a real, you did a very good job on that committee. Yeah. I was a member for several several appointments. Sorry. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, um, let's talk about the Department of the Physics. Uh, a couple of things: how the how the growth of the department and enrollment, and over time that you've been there, has the department grown? Yeah. Well, it, it went through a cycle. When I came here, there were about thirty-seven, thirty-eight people. You mean faculty or staff? Faculty. Okay. And uh, and we had lots of students. I remember the first year I was here, I was teaching this course in electrodynamics. I had 90 students in a graduate course, 600 level. And the reason was that the head of Double E took all, made all the incoming graduate students take that course. So if you can't get through that, you don't belong in Double E. So that was you know, a challenge. It was a real challenge. Well, yeah. It was, that's the way things were. <laughs> and we had. In the honors physics program, I remember the first year we had almost 100 undergraduates. But now, uh, you know, it, it gradually went down. At the, you know, when you're, I think it's, I don't know, it says in any boastful way, but when a faculty member is involved in setting up a program and he's involved in that program, then the program really runs. But the minute he goes and somebody else gets in, it deteriorates. Yeah, that, that's hard. Yeah. One of the things that you've got there is that uh, Van der Graaff accelerator, isn't it? Mm-hmm. For the, just make a comment for the researchers. It's still, it still is not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we had, also we had a cyclotron. I was going to, that was my next thing on the cyclotron. Right. Yeah, that was an that interesting story. It, it's in the history of the physics department. Which is that mm-hmm. recent book that came out. The, uh, the history, uh, didn't someone write Right, a book. I know. I was going to ask. Uh, you were involved with one of those reports. Yeah, well, it's on the it's on the internet. That's on the on the physics department web. But under history, there's a. No, what it was is that this guy Lark Horowitz was a real pusher. Nuclear physics had been discovered in the early 30s, when some guy, named Chadwick, discovered the neutron in 1932. And so, in 1935, Lark Horowitz was always like. We got to get into that business. So he, you know, he got uh, Don Tendon, the head of charge. He and a couple of graduate students, and they built that on nine thousand dollars. You can imagine. 
that, that it costs, you know, maybe, uh, oh, I don't even want to speculate on it. But he got that thing. I remember when I was writing up this history, I looked at some of the correspondence. Plakovitz wrote a letter to the president of some steel company in Chicago. They needed to have the steel for the magnet. And he wrote this big sob story. I mean, it wasn't untrue, but it was... So you build on it. Yeah. And, you know, he said, you know, the, 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 you know, the bill had been for $3,200,000. So the guy cut it back. He says, my cost is so-and-so. That's what I'll charge you. <laughs> you know, he just... <laughs> and so, you know, they built this cyclotron for, for, you know, for pennies, basically. And so then they had its nuclear physics program. You got to remember, there were only one or two of these cyclotrons in the whole United States and the whole world. And one of them was at Purdue. And one of them was at Purdue. That's right. That's Is it right. still here? Uh, we dismantled. But there's another. St what oh. the story goes. Good. Came. Uh, the cyclotrons became very hot stuff because people we were, you know, because of the Los Alamos business. They had to get what are called nuclear cross sections. So there were two places that they could get these nuclear cross sections at Purdue and you know, one of them was at Berkeley. I think it may have been one or two others, but I don't think so. And so, uh, you know, all of a sudden they descended on Purdue, and Purdue the cyclotron was was shut down. I mean, it wasn't it was closed, so to speak. There were guards put on it. And there are a couple of graduate students who were assigned, who were sort of classified to make these cross sections. Interesting. And, uh, you know, and they worked. And then after the war, they, well, there was a, it was in the old physics building. That's with the class of 1950 lecture hall. And that's well, where it was? That's where it was, I think. And uh, you know, then after the war, they, they had to mo modify the cyclotron to make it applicable for these uh, uh, measurements. Yeah, you know, there's a famous cross-section unit called the bar, and that was by these two guys that used to work there. Interesting. Yeah. 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 How did the um, Van de Graaff accelerator, how did that come about? How did you happen to get that here? Uh, I wasn't involved in oh. it, but the nuclear physics people wrote a proposal to the government. The Government said it's going to build five of these. So, uh, being pushed by the dean and other people, eventually moved on. Okay. And is it still open for tours? I mean, can. Uh, I think so. Okay. And it's, it's underneath the, uh, the it's mall? It's under there. the mall, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Is it still being used? Yeah, it's being used. Uh, it's being used not for nuclear physics research, but for sensitive measurements of impurities in water and other things. Okay. Like you can measure one part in 10 million of cer certain isotopes in there. Yeah. In the water, say, what is you irradiate it with the uh, Van de Graaff generator, and then you look at the nuclear decay. And from the nuclear decay, you can deduce what's in there. Yeah, that's very good. Okay. Um, Ralph Bray, was, I read an article, he was yeah. involved in what, the Manhattan Project to some extent? No. or. Oh. No, he was involved at Purdue. Oh, he was a, a faculty member at Purdue. Yeah. Okay. That's another great thing that Lon Horowitz did. When the war started, one of the people who was the head when I came here, Hubert James, went to the Rad Lab in Boston. They were doing research, and Lon Horowitz wrote him, "Can we get some? You know, can we do anything research-wise to help the war effort?" So they got a contract, and uh, or Lon Horowitz got a contract. And I think it was they had a project to make germanium, use germanium. And they discovered, actually, the, uh, what do you call these things? Well, I forgot. They used to be called trios, but they became, uh, I forgot. That's okay. That's all right. right. But, uh, you know, everything in computers was based on these gizmos. Uh, Anyway, they, they tried, they, uh, and, and Ralph Brave was one of those working with others to try to purify germanium. Deuterium or no, uranium? No, 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 it's, it's a gadget. Oh, okay, okay. It's not a, 
transistors. Okay. That's the word I was thinking of. Okay. That they effectively, according to Ralph Gray, had invented transistors near Purdue. And as a matter of fact, I, while I was doing the research for these articles I wrote, there was a visit by a famous physicist, Frederick Zeitz, who uh, said that one of the two guys at Bell Labs who got Nobel Prizes for inventing a transistor, when they had put in their application for a patent, they came here to spy. And they said, and they said, like Horowitz said, isn't there a triode in here somewhere? That's what this guy Seitz said that like Horowitz had said. And you know, that was, of course, that's the point. That's what these transistors are. In the old days, you had to have these big things that uh, heated an element and that emitted uh, electrons and... Sure, to understand. Now, you know, you've got 10 million in there. Right, yeah. I had a comment in it. I was going to ask you that. Lark Horace was, what, 1929 to 1958, so he was ahead for a long time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're all during the war. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but anyway, the two big things that Purdue in the war effort was the cyclotron, where they measured these cross sections that, that I wish they couldn't have built a bomb. Well, no, excuse me. There had to be a decision made whether to go for a fusion or fission bomb. You know, and, and the cross sections that these guys locally were measuring were for the uh, fusion bomb. That's what, you know, it's the hydrogen bomb, not the bomb. I mean, we had nuclear we had right. But they went about, you know, they, and it was done here. And the other thing was on the transistor. Very According to Bray, Purdue had every right to latch onto the transistor. Sure, that's interesting, yeah. Now they have that, uh, you know, you know, it's Physic Fun Fest, you know, that's been going on for a number of years. Yeah. Um, diversity in the depart in the department, that's been going on. I mean, you have a lot of uh, you know, male and female and... and yeah, uh, yeah, you know, we have know. three or four women in the department. Sure. Uh, I mean, there aren't that many w women physicists. And, uh, that brings a point that I, too, I was going to ask you about was, was uh, Vivian Johnson and also um, Anna Akeley. In the Akeley, yeah. Yeah, she was was involved in that department, worked in the department. Mm -hmm. And Vivian Johnson Vivian was Johnson. a faculty member for a long, oh, long yeah, time. Yeah. No, both of them. Right. Mm -hmm. But now they're both deceased. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Three or four. Vivian Johnson, I remember there's a physics society or something, have, they have some of her papers or she's listed, but we have the paper, we have papers in the archives. Uh, Johnson, yeah, I, I got think. a bunch of stuff. Are you have archives? Of well, um, the, we have the archives in special collections, and Sammy Morris is the head of it, head of archives. Yeah, because I, I got that. I'm gonna have, probably have to clean out my office, and I got a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and you need. Go I, I would talk to Sam. Talk, talk to Sammy. I'll give you her email address. You know, that would be okay. Um, let's see what else I've got here. Um, the dean of well, deans of science. Dr. Haas was the dean for a long time, and then Alan Clark came after us, and then there were some others after that, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. whose names I don't, I don't have down. Let's talk about any your any awards or honors that you'd like to share with the researchers that have come down the road for you. Well, no, no biggies. They're uh, all important. No, I mean, there's I was, no, there's I was no elected, big and there's no small. I was elected to Phi Beta Kappa as an undergraduate. Very good. And uh, what else did I do? I was uh, I was a visiting distinguished professor at the Air Force Academy for a year. I don't know if you have it down. In no. There. When was that? When did you do that? I think that was a year before I became secretary of faculty. Okay. Yeah. Did you uh, did you enjoy that? Oh yeah. Out there in Colorado. Yeah. They gave me the rank equivalent to between a, a full colonel and a brigadier. So you know, I had a park in the space. With my name on it. <laughs> don't dare park. Don't even think about parking here. <laughs> my only of your garden house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. And then you've been. A, you're a fellow of the American Physical Society mm -hmm. and uh, American Association of Advancement of Science. And you still keep your hat in, in the New York Academy of Sciences, yeah. which is really nice. Yeah. You know. um, the next stage. You were telling me earlier before for the researchers that uh, you've, been, you've been on halftime, right? 
There you go. This is my fifth year. Yeah. Okay. And so this summer we're going to be doing something different. Yeah. Do you yeah, want to share with us any of your plans that you've got lined no. up? Except the cruise is a good kickoff. Yeah, that's what my wife, she's the one who arranges all these things. And we're going to go, go to, uh, we fly to, to Romania, pick up a ship, and travel down the Danube all through uh, Romania, Hungary, Austria, and wind up in Germany. How long are you going to stay in Germany? About two weeks. Well, I was going to, we're going to go with some very good friends of ours down in Mexico that uh, are going to go with us. And their daughter is a postdoc at the University of Munich. Oh, that's nice. Or München, I think. Yeah. German, but All right. And then you've got your other, other activities will surface, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. What about family? Tell, tell the researchers about. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, you met your wife in Illinois. Do you have children? Yeah, two sons. Okay. One, uh, the older one, uh, 52, so he's down in Texas, the only in Texas, and he works for uh, the uh, Sky Ship, Sky Ship. We used to get free ticket, airplane tickets for them. When Sky Show was owned by American Airlines, it does. No more. No more. No more. We have to pay our own. <laughs> and the other one, my other son is in Carmel, Indiana. He started his own business down there, a consulting firm. But then, then he made a mistake and someone offered him, you know, gold, so he sold out. I don't even know what the, what the current situation is. But. Okay. Did the children go to Purdue? Uh, my sons went to Purdue. Okay. And uh, one of my oldest sons' son, that's my grandson, went to Purdue. But the second one, tuition was too high for him. He went to uh, University of Texas at Austin. Okay. All right. That's good. Do you have a, um, a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? Or a Purdue, any tradition of Purdue that kind of sticks in your mind that you'd like to share with the researchers? A tradition such as the Boilermaker Special or Purdue Pete or anything like no, that? No, I'm not a big uh, oh, okay. sports fan. Or sometimes one of the traditions that several of our uh, interviewees have mentioned is commencement. Yeah, I was involved in commencement. Right, and the, the, the ceremony. The commencement, I think what Dr. Beering made the commencement, I really liked that. Mm -hmm. All right, because be before that, um, it was one just had the one. Yeah, yeah I also when I was in the grad school, the assistant dean of grad school, one of those guys that handed the hoods to the dean to put on the mm -hmm. honorees. That's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I enjoyed that. Yeah, I would think I still so. have, a, have my own uh, gown. Oh, sure. You need it because you need it for a lot of ceremonies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about an uh, outstanding event in your life? Anything comes to mind? <laughs> well, personal or whatever? Well, I'll tell you, one thing is, uh, many years ago, like 30 or so, I once got a call on a Sunday afternoon from a friend in Colorado. And he said this young Mexican couple that are in, in this guy's field, which is agricultural economics, is coming to Lafayette. They don't speak a word of English. Could I pick them up and get them to a hotel and look after them a little bit? I said, oh, sure. So we went around and left. And I think the plumbers or somebody were meeting on campus and there wasn't a hotel space within 50 miles. So this young couple comes and we don't speak Spanish, they don't speak English. But we took them into our house and they stayed with us for two or three weeks until they got themselves. And we became best friends. Very nice. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so like 30 years. Yeah. Did they go back to Mexico then? Yeah, yeah. Oh. after he got his PhD, he went there, went to Mexico. Okay. And uh, we went, I mean, well, the first thing was his wife was pregnant. When they came? Uh, you know, shortly thereafter. Sure. And so, and he had to stay here for finals. And they were afraid that his wife would have the baby before finals and they don't want 
So they talked my wife into flying with her. They didn't want her to go alone on the plane. So she said, you know, she came down here and there was this family, six car full, cars full, and they paraded all through, you know, <laughs> Mexico City, and then took her, took them home. And since then, we traveled there frequently, and all their children came up here in summers and learned English, so they all are fluent in English. Nice relationship that just started out of that phone call, yeah, yeah. a lasting one, which is nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any closing comments or any topics that you'd like to return to that you can think of? Mm, I don't know. It's been a good life at Purdue. I enjoyed it. And uh, I hope the stock market doesn't go too crazy so I can continue to enjoy it when I retire. And, you know, I, I'll tell you, I, I don't know if you want to put this in there. Go ahead. It's right. I think I remember there was a, a professor here, a math professor, who retired at the time on top salary with like twenty five or thirty thousand. Now I think I've seen, I've seen him around since then. You know, I just I feel sorry for him. He doesn't have really have any retirement to speak of. It's yeah. hard. Hmm? It's hard. Yeah. yeah. Challenge too. A big challenge. Yeah. Something yeah. like that. Well, you know, I think yeah. that that people live who live long. That's, uh, that's right. Well, that's probably one of the reasons why I stayed on. You know, I'm 80 now. I stayed on till 80 teaching. Right. Yeah. Good. And I got colleagues in the department that are still there, and as they tell me, they're going out horizontally. They're what? They're going out horizontally. <laughs> We want to thank you, Dr. Gartenhaus, for the oh, interview. It's been very nice. Thank you very much. <clears throat>